my name is Christian Walter. I'm working as a fish ecologist, in particular in large lowland rivers for more than 30 years now and all the time also along the river Oder. And I, I got a nice tickle, the dying river, but the Oder catastrophe has shown us also um, first of all, I have to say, river order is not dead. And in particular this year, we had a rather long-lasting, moderate flood, flood in, in the spring, and the fish found excellent spawning conditions. And the juveniles found excellent nursing conditions this year on, on the flooded flood plains. Also, and we have just seen that that, that that was the reason that I could not attend the whole week or so. We are just doing our juvenile fish sampling along the Oder River, and we find really more than average juvenile fish from this year along the banks. So there is still a very good starting point for recovery of the River Oder, um, but we also found that no species really disappeared after the catastrophe uh, last year. <clears throat> so. Uh, Within the next minute, I will give you a little bit background, fish ecological background to the river Oder, say what happened, why, also how to respond, and whether we learn something about and draw some conclusions out of it. So first of all, river Oder is rather special in a way that the first 500 kilometer to the sea are not blocked by any barrier. Also, so there's a free-flowing river with a free migration route for fish, but not only for fish. And that makes it really exciting for a fish ecologists or so, because we can study fish communities in their natural behavior. They go downstream when the water levels are dropping, and they go upstream when the water levels are increasing. And they shift also to the lateral so we can really study the whole population dynamics there. Germany has its only floodplain national park there. So a couple of reasons to shift the professional interest to the river Oder. Also, and, and to show also a few fish species. Also, it was a study in the river Oder also where this upper river gutchen is really common in the mid-channel section. Also, it prefers the sun bars over there, so we discovered the species there. Uh, another fish species is the Baltic golden loach. It only occurs in Germany, the, the only occurrence is in the river Oder. Also, it's the, the western Order of its distribution area, also, but it particularly depends on sandbars with a moderate flow velocity, so natural river structures. Also, uh, the river odor also because the free communication with the sea became the priority area for re-establishing Baltic sturgeon. Also, sturgeons depend on the migration from the sea to the freshwater spawning habitats. We have in the river Oder the only whitefish population that is naturally recruiting. It's a migratory whitefish. Usually, uh, or in the past, they were present in all larger rivers that drain to the Baltic Sea, to the North Sea. Also, now the river Oder population is the only remaining self-recruiting autochthonous population there. Um, the Baltic loach I mentioned already. We have also a large burbot population there, uh, the only cod species that goes to freshwater, which also migrates along the river. And the blueberry, it's the fish at the bottom also, most people don't know it, but it's also a common cyprinid species that particularly inhabits the mid-channel section. It's also highly dominant in the Oder River, and the population of the river determines the threat status of this species, for example, in Germany. So all in all, the river Oder 
is of really high ecological value. And what is shown on the right, this is um, the, the map of navigation ways, uh, inland navigation ways in Germany, the classification according to the Ministry of Transport, according to their importance for inland vessel transport. And the river order is even not in, in this focus network because of no uh, importance for, for any transport. Just few numbers in the, on the river order, less than 600,000 tons are transported every year on the River Elbe, 25 million tons in the same uh, period on the River Rhine, 300 million tons. Also, their inland navigation is really a priority here. The ecology should become priority also, and therefore we warned already long before the catastrophe uh, of, about this impact the river regulation, the new river regulation of the Oga will have on the ecology. So what happened last year in August? Officially, round about uh, 260 ton fish have been collected. Also, that means about four times this amount really got killed. Also, because they do not all drift at the surface, also not everything has been collected. So a huge amount of fish died last year, but not only uh, the fish, also the mussels. What you see here, uh, these are four mussel species, large mussel species, also that had been collected in the area of the national park in the lower order, also, and after the fish and mussel kill round about 60% of these individual mussels have been lost. Also, and you have to know, mussels are a very important filter feeder in large rivers. A single mussel filters up to 40 liter uh, water uh, and, and that really contributes also to getting rid of any organic material. So what happened last year? Also, we had a massive algae bloom of a species called Trinesium parum. This is a brackish water algae that bloomed uh, in, in amounts of more than 140 million uh, cells per liter water. And unfortunately, this algae species is able to produce a toxin. It's this fancy molecule at the bottom also, and this has hemolytic effect also and kills fish, mussel, and also jill breathing snails. Um, the point here also, it is an algae bloom. It was a completely man-made event also that a brackish water algae can bloom in fresh waters, needs fresh water had to become brackish. And this works only if you put on this charge huge amounts of salt into the fresh waters. So that the primary reason that this algae could bloom in the river Oda uh, was the salt load. Uh, and we measure salt load uh, as conductivity, um, and you see the, the conductivity data uh, from last year, August. Within a day, the conductivity reached the measuring scale at that time of the automatic measuring station from uh, the Landesamt for uh, the Environment in Frankfurt Oder. Also, um, so it shows really high salinity. Uh, during this time, fostering the algae bloom. <laughs> the worst thing here is that it was not really new. Also, we have for 10 years already in the river Oda an increase in salinity of about 5% every year. 
it was well known that neither in Poland nor in Germany any threshold values uh, were met. Also, we had high amounts of salinity. The really differences, we still were not aware about this potential impact. Before last year, nobody was really caring too much about this salinity because at the level of up to 2,000 microsiemens per centimeter gun activity, it doesn't harm fish. Also, nothing would happen just because of the salinity. Also, and therefore, nobody was really caring about. And now we know it better. It's not the salinity that harms the fish, it's the salinity that provides optimum living condition for a toxic brackish water algae. And now this algae is everywhere uh, in the system. Also, so in principle, oh, looks a little bit different at my, my computer. So the, the older catastrophe was man-made. It was in principle uh, the high uh, or the uh, further beside uh, the, this algae load. Also, we have to keep in mind uh, that we know algae blooms very well for new trophic lakes. Also, and algae do not only need nutrients, high temperature, sunlight, and in this particular case, also uh, salt. Also, they need in particular a high water retention time to develop. So stagnant water and usually rivers are flowing and therefore they provide very pessimal conditions for algae growth but if we create impoundments if we have barriers in the river or if we have very low water conditions because of river regulation uh, then we have the problem that dropping water levels at low water conditions we also increase the retention time of the water and um, improve the growing conditions for the algae. And in particular, this regulation is important in a way. Also, this is uh, a recently uh, finished area in the upper left corner at Reitwein, Oder at Reitwein, that is uh, shortly about 10 kilometers above the mouth of the river water, water uh, in the middle section also, and this is also the, the principle of the regulation that takes place at the moment. The groins will become longer, higher, and the result will be that the faster flowing river will go into the depths and in size, because all our rivers, in particular if they are regulated for inland navigation, they lack bank erosion. And this is an important element where river also act on, where flow velocity acts on bank erosion. If you do not allow for bank erosion, you only have the depth incision. So, um, and if a river is deeper, we have the natural uh, patterns of flow that we have high water levels usually in spring and then when it stops rain or when the snow melt is over we have lower water level that it's the natural um, uh, rating curve of a river and when we start to discharge the water as fast as possible in spring when we have more and if we do not retain it also then uh, we get earlier rid of the water but nothing will come after that so that the water level will also drop earlier also low water levels will be reached earlier and if the river bed becomes deeper also the next water level will become deeper and the water the landscape and, and we then also get uh, lower flow velocities for fish also uh, lower lateral connectivity, but in particular the lower flow velocity also improves the conditions for algae. So how to respond? 
are so. We need the immediate measures are so to drastically reduce the salt load. Unfortunately, uh, nothing has happened so far here also, and we have to change also emission rules from loads to concentration. So if you are allowed to discharge a certain load here, in this case, salt to the river also, then it has to be adjusted according to the actual discharge that the final concentration or conductivity doesn't get over a certain threshold level. Also, in the longer run, we have to revitalize the natural flow regime of the river to allow for more natural flow, also, which almost means that in the river we have no single slurp rivers, we have small islands, we have small branches. Also, when you always have patterns of faster flowing and lower flowing areas, that don't also real field like fish uh, find a refuge. We have to improve the river's resilience against uh, the impacts of climate change. And one way to do this is the consequent implementation of the water framework directive, for example, to get the river in a good ecological state of because that automatically also includes the good river status. <laughs> uh, at the moment, we have the situation that we have a significant loss of these filter feeders, of the muscles I mentioned already, so that the river is still more sensitive against uh, algae bloom of any kind, not only of gymnasium, also because less organisms are available to efficiently filter any organic materials uh, out of the river. Thank you. And we have also the algae in the river. Last year, it was by chance that the algae somewhere in the catchment got good growing conditions. Also, this year, for sure, we know it's everywhere in the system. It's still there. So it's not the question, will the algae occur, yes or not? It's the question, when will it start growing? Does it start growing? Uh, and will it produce toxins? System. So, and how to make a river more resilient? That's, that's the question when we talk about also what we need more is a more natural flood regime that includes also more natural flood protection. Also, to allow the river when the water is there to inundate its flood plain. And we need also more water retention in the landscape. And that's not only during floods. Also, uh, we have also to keep the rain in the landscape also. And that means also to close many of these available old drainage ditches and to make uh, the arable land also able further uh, to, to get or to, to store more water uh, <clears throat> in the system also. But we still also have to revitalize uh, the buffer function and the filter function of the flood plain. Also, <clears throat> improve the lateral connectivity and structural diversity. And that was again too fast. And to revitalize the hydromorphologic processes. These are the processes, in particular, next to flowing water, is the sediment generation, the sediment transport also and the sediment sorting because these processes also uh, allow for the certain habitats that they exist in the river system. So did we learn something from this catastrophe? Unfortunately not really much. Also this is also an actual spring pictures uh, from, from the, the middle reach of the river Oda. Uh, we still do the opposite, what we know should do uh, to allow the river to adjust to climate change impacts also. Uh, we still regulate the river also and we still further degrade the river system. And so far we missed 
already one year to do something against the salt load. The salt load at the moment is more or less the same than last year uh, in August. Also, the next please. Also, uh, I don't want to bash people who are in particular responsible for the older river because this is definitely not the only river where this happens. Also, next please. This is the state of European freshwaters, the implementation of the water framework directive. Unfortunately, it's difficult to see, uh, please. Uh, but on, on the right, red means not on track, and we were nowhere on track. Also, throughout Europe, to improve the <coughs> ecosystem in wetlands, it's the upper row, to reduce hydromorphologic pressures, to reduce river pollution, also and to reduce water abstraction. Next, please. And this is still uh, the situation in European rivers. Also, 60% fail the water framework directive targets, are not in a good status. To be honest, it was also 60% at the first river basin management plan, and the situation is quite similar in Germany. We started with 8% water bodies in good ecological status, and we now, 20 years later, have 9%. So, uh, impressive improvement. Also, uh, and in, if you see degraded hydromorphology, diffuse source pollution throughout Europe, the main reason also why we fail good ecological status, the targets of the Water Framework Directive. Next, please. And we still live in the luxury that we know the main pressures that hamper achieving our environmental targets. And we support those pressures with much more money than the implementation of the Water Framework Directive itself. Also, the subsidies for agriculture without any environmental obligation is still ongoing. Subsidies for small hydropower, uh, subsidies for increasing the inland navigation network. So as long as we still put lots of money in the pressures, it's no wonder that we do not achieve really ecological improvements. And the next, and we have to start to adjust our uses of the river to climate change and to the impacts because they will come. And what you see here on the left uh, is water abstraction for, uh, and most of the water, 40%, is abstracted throughout Europe, European average, for irrigation. And it's, it's hard, no, so please go back. It's, it's hard to see here, but 65% of the waters comes from rivers. Also, and what you see here, these are uh, the, the four uh, quarters of the year, first January to March, March to June, July uh, to September, and we abstract most water in summer at low water conditions. And then we blame general climate change for having no water in the river system. That's definitely not really the way to mitigate droughts in the river system. We have to be aware that also this uh, lack of water in the rivers is to a large degree uh, man-made. Also, when we abstract most of the water that we use uh, from rivers, at the time where they have low water, then we create problems. And one, in my opinion, rather simple way uh, to overcome this uh, mismatch would be that agriculture would have to pay for irrigation water because they don't. And as long as they don't have to pay for the water that they use for irrigation in summer, they have no interest to retain water when it's there. And this is what we need. Also, uh, to conclude, 
Now, at the end, also, there is, in particular in environmental law, a huge discrepancy between ambition and reality. Also, for, for my personal opinion, it's nowhere in any other law uh, so distant like what we are aiming for and what we are really doing and implementing. Also, and it's, it's really, it's, it's nearly, nearly too late also for, for a long time. Also, these environmental targets, in particular for the Water Framework Directive, they need to become mandatory for all sectors. It's not the problem of the water sector, so they are responsible for this, and same as um, Nature Conservancy is responsible for the Habitat Directive and all other do what they want to do. Also, that will not work. These targets have to become mandatory uh, for all. And, and one point still is the consequent implementation of the Water Framework Directive, also uh, to make rivers really more resilient, also to enhance the ecological status, also, and large floodplain rivers, like Oda, also, they are really important for that. Also, they are really the, the key ecosystem because when they are in a good condition, also, then we achieved something at a really large spatial scale. Also, it's, it's a difference whether a large river is in a good condition or whether a tiny headwater is in a good condition. Also, what we have so far. Um, and we still need the paradigm shift for exploiting in particular these large rivers uh, as much as we can to conserve these rivers. Also, and with that, I'm finished. <laughs>